Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you're new, and welcome back if you are. And my name is EDJ, and we're continuing with the the Byzantine series by Dova Hadi of unbiased history. So last time we looked at basically the early time of the Byzantine Empire, mainly with Justin, and now we're moving on to Justinian, who is, as I mentioned last video, arguably the most popular Byzantine. Emperor, not because I have any facts supporting that, it's because he's the only one I've heard of. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, like I said, in public schools here in the U.S., we, we don't really learn anything about the Byzantine Empire. We only learned about the very early formation of the Roman Empire, but that's a long, a long time ago in history. You know, the Byzantines, we learn nothing about. I've never personally gone and researched much, except if its fall, like I mentioned, and its role in the Third Crusade and how the Christians really screwed it over, but, <laughs> but, yeah, like I said, you, we heard nothing, I don't know any of the Emperor's names, and it's the only one I've ever heard of in my life is Justinian the Great. Justinian and Theodora, usually I've heard that they're, like, one of history's greatest power couples or whatnot, but that, that's it. Uh, something else I know about Byzantine is that at one point it it managed to get back a lot of land from the western half of the empire that fell and almost tried to bring it all back. I don't know if Justin last video it ended with Justinian basically saying that was his goal, so he might be the emperor who did that. If not, we'll probably get there. So. Yeah, that's really all I got to say. I'm really sad because I think there's only two more videos of this, and I'm kind of done with Dova Hari, which is weird. It's weird because I've had a lot of fun with this, with these videos. It'll be weird moving on and seeing what comes next. I've been told that some people wanted me to look at Epic History TV, and I'm definitely, I think that might have to be the next one. The next history series I get to. <laughs> Either that or I stick with the Rome shtick and just rename this channel the Rome guy. I only react to Rome videos. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. But yeah, Epic History TV might be next because I was told a, a while ago to check that out. <clears throat> so yeah, without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Oh, but first, I put the link to the original video down in the description below. If you want to see that without my face or any of my voice or pauses interrupting, feel free to look at that. Always support the original work. So, without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Let's watch Justinian the Great by Unbiased History Dovahadi. Work a parody, guys. Remember, YouTube. <laughs> Ah yes, Justinian the Great, here we go. So Justin had just died, Justinian made emperor and the barbarians invaded the east, right? So before all that, Kavad had counseled with his lord Satan <laughs> to help him out, and that he did. Khosrow asked for- Oh my gosh, like I mentioned last video, I just find it hilarious that Satan's there now. <laughs> He's the new dark force, right? It's not Dido or anyone else, it's just Satan's there trying to defeat Byzantium, Byzantines. For Justinian's rule to be cursed beyond any emperors before, both knew his potential and were dead set on ruining Christian Rome's resurrection at any cost. As a starter, he conjured a devastating earthquake that ruined Antioch and wrecked its once strong walls. Taking advantage, Kavad raided deep into Syria, capturing 400 nuns and live sacrificing them to their dark deities. You think it's bullshit? Look it up. After this barbaric oh act, Justinian split the Eastern legions in two armies, the Armenian one under a general named Sittas, and the main one under the one, the only, Belisarius. Named Magister Militum, he was assigned a new legal assistant, Procopius, a bitter, hate-filled secularist pleb that hated Justinian. And while he would write mostly true history about his reign, he would also write another version, filled with lies, slanders, and the old resentment all petty men have towards their betters. 
As for the Sassanids, Escavad tried blackmailing the Romans with the lives of border civilians while gathering a 50,000 strong horde to forever destroy Dara, Belisarius stood nearby with less than half that. For hundreds of years, Roman generals had been cultivating a strong cavalry force, the Bucellari, and under Belisarius, they became heavily armed and trained Romans. Well, half of them. The other half were Huns. You heard it right, for Belisarius, just like Aetius, was yet another Roman who commanded the fear of these savages for Rome's benefit. As the Sassanid chieftain wow. sent smug, insulting letters, Belisarius hanged them to his banner for his soldiers to laugh at. The barbarians then charged, but Belisarius had digged huge trenches to cripple the Sassanid cavalry, had his Huns surging from behind and flanked them. Belisarius slaughtered his fair share and sent the remains fleeing away. Sittas had won his own victory in the north, which also infuriated Kavad he sent 20,000 cavalry to rush in and sack the vulnerable Antioch. Belisarius and his Bucellari intercepted them in time, but here's the thing. Belisarius was one of those great generals that were loved by his soldiers, but deeply, deeply envied by his officers and sub-commanders. So out of nowhere his sub officers attacked with all riders, again and again. crushed by the Sassanids and Belisarius worked his magic to prevent a slaughter. Such would become the standard. Thankfully Kavad had died by then, so the Sassanids pissed off. Belisarius had returned to the capital and Justinian prepared to send Khosrau, now the Sassanid king, east to hopefully cause a civil war. And yeah, he did, but he won it, seized power and sued for peace while he was weak. But there's more. After growing up together with Justinian and Justin swimming in Anastasius' gold, Khosrau devised <laughs> that the best way to cripple the Romans was to cripple their economy. Khosrau thus demanded 11,000 pounds of shiny yellow rock for a green to a piece, but not just any piece, an eternal piece. Justinian agreed on the condition Whoa. the gold would pay for defenses against the Huns. The Sassanids were really their bitch. Now here's a tough question. How long will this eternal peace last, who will break it and for what reason? Here are your options. Speaking of Justinian, he by now held such knowledge of the Christian force he could bend the barbarians to his whim. Much like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. As a Christian, I can I can attest that we have the power to just control barbarians. They do it all the time. But <laughs> no, but in all actuality, it's amazing, like just how much the same story is told throughout history. I mean, history, real life history, is still wild, and I like it more than fiction nowadays. Especially Chinese history. Chinese history is the most insane thing I've ever watched. <laughs> I was looking up the Taping Rebellion the other day, and that dude who claimed to be... This, he claimed to be, like, the brother of Jesus. And, like... <laughs> it ended up starting a war. I think that had more casualties in World War One, Or really up there, which is insane to me. And that was just China. It wasn't all Europe fighting each other. That's... I'm telling you, man, Chinese history is the funniest thing ever, like, I just love it. It's so insane, I wish, like, Hollywood would, like, make more movies about it. <laughs> and then, like, people would, would watch it and be like, is, is this true? Is this Hollywood, like, in fiction being thrown in? It's like, no, nah, I'm 100% played straight. I'm sorry, I got on a side tangent, but... Yeah. <laughs> like Belisarius of the Huns, using said skill to make one of Theodoric's officers, Mundo, now Mundus, serve him by slaughtering Slavs and Bulgars in the Balkans, later recalling him to replace Belisarius in the East. Justinian indeed began converting and subduing many bordering barbarians, Huns, Slavs, those desert tribes in the southeast, <laughs> Even Goths, Theodoric's own daughter and queen of the Ostrogoths, that is, Amala Swinfa, over which Justinian held such sway he convinced her to raise her son like a Roman, but none such subservient barbarian quite compared to Hilderic, whom he didn't even have to personally convert and was very much dominant over. So much so, rumor was Hilderic planned to give Africa to Justinian after his death, but being ruled by civilized non-heretics was too much for the Vandals to take. So they usurped and imprisoned Hilderic, now replaced by Gelamer, who refused all of Justinian's demands to restore Hilderic, or even send him to Constantinople. Speaking of Constantinople... Uh, to understand what's to come, you must understand Justinian's reforming tendencies. Not only did he purge corruption and injustices wherever possible, but to forever making doing so simple, he assembled the best jurists the empire had to offer, led by the greatest of them, Tribonian tasked with compiling every law, edict and custom in the empire into a single civic code. 
encoding all laws from as far as the time of Constantine, the Tetrarchy and further back, they had done it. A single unified detailed account of every law in the empire for all to obey. The Corpus Iuris Civilis, the body of civil law, forevermore the basis of most legal systems. This Justinianic code, as it came to be known, wrestled many Jimmys. Mostly heretical, pagan, secular, apostate, and unbaptized Jimmys. Because it also focused on religious orthodoxy, you see. Justinian persecuted all degenerates that didn't abide by his new law code, including closing the pagan academy in Athens to eternal secularist butthurt forcing all teachers of history, morals, and philosophy to do so through a Christian lens to maximize the veracity of their teachings. And the revised taxation system stipulated in the code was enforced by Justinian's new finance minister, John the Cappadocian. His genius coming from that, once faced with rich tax evaders, he just tortured them until they gave their share. Now, Prococcus <laughs> would spread lies that he was corrupt and all, but who would ever pay attention to such a biased telling of history anyway? This all combined with Justinian demanding strict court etiquette for both him and his lady, together with Justinian's continuous support for the Blue faction earned him enemies all over. Unfortunately, since the Blues won all the time, many Green fans shifted sides over the years, eventually making both sides just a bunch of violence-prone plebs. After one of the many pleb fights, Justinian ordered the leaders to be executed, and as they were hanged, two executions were botched, one for a green and a blue, both taking refuge in a church. After that in the Hippodrome, the angry plebs started demanding them to be pardoned. Justinian ignored the plebs as he should, but they just got angrier. So long the greens had gone in a losing streak, their entire lives that is, that they started shouting that which they desired most. Nika! Nika! Victory! Victory! Soon the entire Hippodrome began shouting Nika at Justinian. But in truth, all he could hear was something like... Dang it. games are going big! Play the official pe <laughs> The insufferable chanting soon made Justinian start negotiating. But nope. The plebs were already invading prisons, liberating the inmates, then setting fire to it. They set fire to everything, really. Hospitals, schools, houses, apartments, the imperial palace, and proving plebs shall forever be below this day, the Baths of Zeuxippus, built by Septimius Severus and decorated by Constantine himself with statues from all over the empire of Greco-Roman heroes, was set ablaze and completely destroyed. The Great oh Church, goodness. once built by Constantius II, then Theodosius II, was also burned and destroyed, along with most of the center of Constantinople. Furious and saddened, Justinian asked the plebs what they wanted to stop, and they said the resignation of both John the Cappadocian and Tribonian. Now, plebs didn't know how to read, much less who the tax and legal ministers were. And sure enough, Justinian soon found out many senators were feeding information, guiding and directing the writers, so he ordered them all to leave. Justinian then pretended to fire John and Tribonian, but as he predicted, the plebs didn't care. By now, the plebs wanted a new emperor, so they dragged the nearest relative of Anastasius, ironically enough, that they could get, his nephew Hypatius. Taken into the Hippodrome, acclaimed emperor by the plebs of a golden chain and surrounded by treacherous senators gearing him up, he started to kind of ride this wave. At this sight, many bureaucrats urged Justinian to leave, to flee the city and go into hiding. But that's when Theodora, now a true Roman emperor, spoke her mind, and she was all like, Oh, monopion thavma. Pion onoma ipi misse, o kalos xenos. Imi Theodora, i fili du Vizandio. That is, I would rather die an empress than live as a pleb. And Justinian wholeheartedly Based. agreed. And so he summoned the two generals that were around waiting redeployment Mundus and Belisarius, plus one of his bureaucrats, Narcis. For Narcissus, he gave the gold to go bribe off the cheap green and blue leaders. As for Belisarius, he gave him reinforcements and make a guess what he asked him to do. Yeah. <laughs> Of the 50,000 rioting plebs present, Belisarius slaughtered 30,000 of them. Oh For crushing the riot, he was acclaimed as Belisarius Plebicus. But surely enough, the pleb Procopius didn't allow that to be recorded. 
bringing Hypatius and the conspirators to Justinian, he had them all either executed, exiled, or their property confiscated. John and Tribonian were reinstated, and Justinian, now devoid of any popular political opposition, set forth to rebuild Constantinople and the empire to match his eternal dream. The usurpation in Africa never left his mind, and if the Vandals so wanted war with Rome, he would make it the first step of his reconquest. Now, many thought retaking Africa was impossible, given how Leo failed with a hundred thousand men and Majorian never even got to leave the port, but Justinian knew he had Belisarius. And yeah, Belisarius was the sent west with just 15,000 men, part of them his Bucellari, starting off with two drunk Huns killing a soldier, and him executing them. While the Vandals were dealing with two revolts, one in Libya, which allowed Belisarius to resupply, and another in Sardinia, which dragged the Vandal fleet to fight it. Justinian persuaded Amalasuinfa to let Belisarius use the Sicilian ports, and then he just straight up landed beside Carthage. Speaking with the once Roman citizens, Belisarius forced his mercenaries to behave as liberators and pay for everything they took. Learning of this, Gallimer killed Hilderic and marched to fight Belisarius with 25,000 barbarians. For he had a plan, a plan to let Belisarius pass through the valley near Carthage's Mountains of Salt and flank him between it with his brother's army. But Belisarius had sent his Bucellari to scout though, and them alone found and crushed the Vandal trap, killing Gallimer's brother, who, Dang. once charging in thinking his plan was working, found his brother's corpse and lamented the loss of this monstrous vile barbarian, sad that the world was now a better place. Then Belisarius <laughs> showed up, destroyed his army, and Gallimer fled. As Belisarius took Carthage, Gallimar raised a new army with his other brother back from Sardinia. Sieging Carthage and cutting its water, he tried to get the Huns to change sides, which just wasn't going to happen with Belisarius around. Despite outnumbered again, Belisarius charged outside of Carthage and crashed into the Vandals several times, killing Gallimar's other brother and making the world an even better place. <laughs> Belisarius then liberated Hippo, and while far too late to save St. Augustine, he got in just in time to retake all of the treasures the Vandals had taken from Rome, which itself paid for the whole campaign. Gallimer nice. had prepared a feast in the event of his certain victory, which Belisarius had for himself as he sat on the Vandal throne. <laughs> Gallimer was eventually found and captured, the last remnant of Vandal resistance crushed, Sardinia and Corsica reconquered and all North African cities retaken. A Roman administration was put back in charge, the freed Romans cheered for their liberators and Africa was again a province of the Roman Empire. And let's not forget. Justinian awesome. had come one step closer to his dream, and Belisarius Plebicus Vandalicus to an immortal legacy. Justinian let him choose to either stay and govern Africa or return home, and he chose the latter. For such a magnificent Roman victory, Justinian rewarded Belisarius with the right of all victorious Romans. The first triumph in ages. To prove... Yeah, no. Yeah, Belisarius. Hopefully I'm saying that right, but... If there's anyone who deserves a try on behalf for him, he just basically took back Africa, and he did it with so, like, 15,000 men, which doesn't sound like a lot on paper, but, like, that's amazing, man. Yeah, well-deserved. With his humility, Belisarius marched his triumph on foot, dragging the imprisoned Gallimer <laughs> and all the wealth retaken from Africa. At Justinian's side, Gallimer quoted some gibberish and was told to shut his barbarian mouth. Justinian had not been idle during it all, using Anastasius' gold to rebuild Constantinople better and grander than ever before. But his greatest project was the reconstruction of the city's great church. 
He gave the builders all the money they needed, ordering the greatest church of all time built as fast as possible. In only five years, he got his wish, with the construction of the greatest church in history, the Shrine of the Holy Wisdom of God, shortened to Holy Wisdom, in Greek, Hagia Sophia. Entering the church for the first time, Justinian said aloud, Solomon, I have outdone you. Just ask Titus. While Justinian was busy building, awesome. his sister Vigilantia the Younger was busy breeding, giving the emperor two nephews, Justin and Marcellus, plus Projecta, who due to being beautiful and the emperor's niece was a magnet for usurpers empire-wide. But now history focuses on Italy, as is so often used to, with the Goths growing to despise Roman-friendly Amalasuinfa taking her son to be raised a proper bloodthirsty barbarian. So much so, he died a young man. Now rumors were abound that Amala Swinfa planned to give Italy to Justinian, and even when she appealed to her cousin Fiodo had for help, he betrayed, killed, and usurped her. This prompted one of the once Romans under Gothic rule, Liberius, to defect back to the empire, and inform Justinian what happened. All the emperor had to do was look at Belisarius, and he knew what to do. For too long the Roman Empire had been robbed of its home, of its birthplace. With the same skill it had conquered the world, the horrors of the 5th century would be overturned. And so, Justinian ordered Belisarius to retake Rome for its empire. With only a little more than 7,000 men, Belisarius sailed through the west and seized almost all of southern Italy, while Mundus was Holy sent crap. to reconquer Dalmatia. The Goths did push them back, but he re-retook it at a cost of his life, with reinforcements securing it. The reconquest of Italy was going so fast, Fiodo had almost just gave it all up for peace. But then the mercenaries in Africa revolted, killing his momentum and forcing Belisarius to deal with it. Justinian soon replaced him in the task with his cousin and heir, Germanus, who crushed the rebellion, letting Belisario to go back to Italy. And now on his way laid Naples, almost impossible to siege given how he had spread out his forces to secure the south. But as an Isaurian mercenary wandered about an aqueduct, he found the most curious thing. Dragging Belisarius to see it, it was a waterway that led straight into the city. Belisarius then ordered it widened, and by the next day, the city was taken. But Fiodo had by then had been usurped by the new Gothic king, Vitigis, who retreated with his forces north. Indeed, in fear of Belisarius, the Goths had left Rome alone, and with a papal invitation into the Eternal City, Belisarius marched there. After decades of barbarian tyranny, Rome was finally back under Roman rule. Well, what was left of it anyway? After the fall of the West, the economic destruction and multiple sackings, Rome was now a shadow of its former self. Now almost entirely ruins and abandoned houses from a bygone age, populated only by a few tens of thousands of weak, miserable plebs. How Augustus would have wept. Vitigis though had gathered his gothic horse and was set on taking Rome once more. Belisarius, however, was set on fighting for every inch of the Aurelian walls, digging a huge moat around it. And even when the aqueducts were blocked, Belisarius had a mill built between two boats on the Tiber, ensuring grain could still be made into bread and feed everyone. But before the Goths fully sieged Rome, Belisarius took his awesome. Bucellari to scout to the Tiber crossing. On their way, they were ambushed by a huge Gothic force who recognized Belisarius' white-faced horse and focused on him. Shot, slashed and hit all over, Belisarius slaughtered his way out, killing many Goths at the cost of his armor and being drenched in blood. Being pursued back to Rome, the soldiers at the gates didn't recognize Belisarius with the helmet injuries and blood. Given only seconds to react, Belisarius ordered a countercharge at a far bigger Gothic cavalry, and he did it with such ferocity the soldiers realized that, yeah, that was Belisarius. Finally let in, he commended the soldiers for their caution, and as the Goths tried fucking with the Tiber's mill by throwing corpses in the water, Belisarius set up a chain across the river to catch all the breeze. Later the Goths tried pulling up some siege towers on the walls, the animals were killed and the siege towers disabled. Belisarius then began hiring some locals into the army, make them proper Romans again. And with the new reinforcements from Justinian, he started launching several Bucellari raids, scattering the Goths and destroying their camps. Vitigis got so mad he ordered all the senators he had taken hostage in Ravenna to be slaughtered. Little did he know that no one really cared about the senators anymore. For a long time. <laughs> but one day the plebs he conscripted disobeyed. Yeah, I think people stopped caring about the senators after the empire started, right? Because from then on they're useless. <laughs> oh man. 
Dude, Belisarius is really pulling a Julius Caesar. I remember, like, was it the Battle of Antioch where he built, like, a wall around him and then was fighting the, the armies of Vercingetorix from all over the place? Like, it's reminding me of that. Also, I, from this duo of Justinian and Belisarius, I'm getting, like, an Augustus and, like, a grip of vibe from the two of them. Like, one, the general, and the other, the, you know... The guy running the show of the government. Though Agrippa was really great in governmental matters too. He, he wasn't just a great general. He could actually rule alongside Augustus. They orders and just went to loot the Gothic camp. Getting all attacked, Belisarius once again had to work his magic to minimize losses. During the siege, Belisarius received orders from Theodora to substitute the current Gothic appointed pope, Silverius, with the one she thought was a Monophysite ally, Vigilius, who was just pretending to get her support. And after Silverius was caught conspiring with senators and Goths, Belisarius exiled the former and elevated the latter. Procopius would put you page further and further lies to smear Belisarius, but he made sure to keep such lies in his book of lies, awaiting for a better chance to demean him in the future. Sick of fighting, Vitiges begged the Romans to surrender, and Belisarius replied, Fuck off! As for Rome, moreover, <laughs> which we have captured, in holding it we hold nothing which belongs to others. But it was you who trespassed upon this city in former times, though it not belong to you at all. And now you have given it back, however unwillingly, to its ancient possessors. And whoever of you has hopes of setting foot in Rome without a fight is mistaken in his judgment. For as long as Belisarius lives, it is impossible for him to relinquish this city. Oh, but the siege went on that is and on. Awesome. The meals couldn't produce enough bread, meal sausage became the standard, the plebs began plebbing, but as the Bucellari and Huns kept wrecking the Goths, Vitigis sued for a truce. During it, thousands of more reinforcements were sent by Justinian, led by Vitalian's nephew, John. Proof that not all nephews of great Romans were great Romans themselves. Vitigis then broke the truce, cause of course, attacking the Tiber and miserably failing. With Vitigis retreating back through the long repaired Milvian Bridge, getting a farewell gift by having half of his hordes slaughtered before he crossed. Belisarius then gave John 2,000 Bucellari to push north and leave no forts behind. John then went northeast, left all forts behind and took a city near Ravenna. Belisarius told him to return, lest he be encircled by Goths, but John refused and he was encircled by Goths. It was then that 7,000 more reinforcements arrived from the east, led by Narses. Belisarius planned to just leave the insubordinate John to his fate and advance north given the Gothic numbers, but Narses remembered him of the 2,000 invaluable Bucellari with him. Belisarius insisted on his position, but Narses didn't relent because of a literal technicality. So, again, Belisarius went to work his magic before his army tore apart. As the Goths starved John to death, they were completely surrounded on all sides by a gigantic Roman army, with several campfires seen from the distance and a large navy on the coast. Terrified, the Goths lifted the siege and fled to Ravenna. Belisarius then told his men to end the charade, having used a series of tricks to pretend having a larger army. Being saved from Whoa. certain death, John expressed his most sincere gratitude to Narses. <laughs> As Belisarius liberated more and more of Italy, Mediolanum revolted to his side and begged for a garrison to defend it. Belisarius could spare around 1,000 men, but other cities asked for garrisons as well, so only about 300 actually got there. The Franks, on the other hand, having subjugated the Burgundians and siding with the Goths, gave them 10,000 Burgundians to go help siege Mediolanum. Belisarius then urgently ordered the nearby John to go rush there and save the city, but he refused, saying he only took orders from Narses. Belisarius oh then wrote gosh. to Narses, who agreed with the orders, and when John read them, he caught a mild fever and delayed his march. Meanwhile, Major. Oh, what a petty jerk. <laughs> oh, that dude. <laughs> Once again, great generals being weighed down by petty. Like I mentioned in the fall of Rome, it's like, yeah, a lot of Rome's problems were just that they weren't unified, right? Like, generals and legates and stuff would just rebel, like, from the emperor, from just their own, like, that was like the story of the third century, like, 
the crisis of the third century, just legates and stuff rebelling. It's like, oh, if you were just unified, so many of Rome's problems wouldn't have existed if they weren't turning on each other. It's like, oh man, very... They self-sabotage a lot, the Romans. I mean, you could say that about, like, any empire group of people in history, right? But, like, oh man. Bellinum's guard had all starved to death, with the survivors saying they would open the gates if only the barbarians spared the city's population. They did, they won't. Major Lonum was almost completely destroyed. The entire population either killed, raped, or enslaved. All the wealth stolen and most buildings burned down. The Franks themselves would invade, but North Italy had been so razed and ruined they couldn't sustain their horde, and returned. As the devastation spread north, Belisarius reported it all to Justinian, who got so mad he recalled Narses from Italy, and explicitly wrote back that Belisarius and Belisarius alone was the only authority in Italy. All this while desperate desperate Vitiges tried one of his last tricks, sending envoys to Kosral, telling him to break the eternal peace now that most of Rome's legions and generals were in Italy. Having almost completely taken the north, Belisarius then cornered Vitiges in Ravenna, eager to end the war with total victory. But Justinian had caught wind of Vitiges' envoys to Kosral. Ah, eh, not really. He just knew the barbarians would backstab him sooner or later. Yeah, so as smart. Belisarius was about to take Ravenna, orders came for him to make a compromise treaty with the Goths. As a not so subtle Jabba John, he said he would only do it if Justinian himself signed it. Not because <laughs> of insubordination, but just to buy enough time to show that Ravenna was about to fall. He didn't even have to wait for that, cause Vitigis came up with the last of his tricks, proposing Belisarius' peace through reviving the Western Roman Empire with Belisarius as the new Western Roman Emperor he won't and the Goths it. as his loyal guardians of Italy, if only he betrayed Justinian. And yeah, Belisarius told Vitiges he was all for it. No way. The Goths then opened the gate, let Belisarius in and he arrested Vitiges, <laughs> freed Amalaswinfa's daughter, Matas- Yeah, you can't... You can tell he ha he's a chad for a reason, he has integrity. Yeah, he, he no way he was gonna betray Justinian, dude. Swinfa took back all the wealth they had stolen from Italy and proclaimed Ravenna reconquered in the name of Justinian. Vitigis would be sent to Constantinople to die in captivity, Mataswinfa would be set to marry Germanus, and most important of all, after years of fierce campaign, Italy, the home province where it all began, had been freed from barbarian tyranny. In his bliss, Justinian would ask Belisarius for details, a full report of his exploits in Italy. Belisarius would make a proud smile, and in the honor of Stilicho, Aetius, Majorian, and so many more, let him see the casualties. Rome's revival was at hand. Yesterday Africa, today Italy, tomorrow Hispania, Gaul, Britain, Dacia. Justinian couldn't help but dream. Peace had been achieved in the west, which means war would soon come in the east. You see, angry that Rome was recovering its lost provinces, Khosrau began grasping at straws to reinitiate conflict. 
demanding part of the Vandal loot cause, I kid you not, the campaign was only possible because of the eternal peace. Justinian <laughs> sent him scrap, but not enough for the barbarian. Furthermore, Khosrow had been wanting to consolidate his access to the Black Sea. Would make assassinate that happen Constantinople easier. <clears throat> but it was only after Justinian began enforcing his new lock code there that he began preparations to break the peace treaty. So, did any of you actually guess wrong? Speaking of enemies of humanity, Justinian had been trying really hard to end the Monophysite heresy. If their whole shtick was over how many natures Jesus has, then Justinian hoped by saying Jesus was divine, human, and a single person would leave things vague enough for the heretics to relent. But no. <laughs> Moreover, when the Pope visited, he convinced him only the persecution and slaughter of heretics would make Jesus happy. And through persistent hatred, he managed to confine most of the Monophysite heresy to Egypt. What he couldn't confine, though, were the Slavs and Bulgars that again raided the Danube, ransacking deep into phrase. At the very least, a few Christian monks had managed to smuggle a few silkworm eggs from a far eastern barbarian kingdom, setting up a native silk production facility in Constantinople. But in the capital, the only real problem was overpopulation. Too many plebs were breeding and moving there. But it was all an ironic effort in hindsight. In just another normal day of ruling, building and purging, Justinian's surroundings suddenly became darker. Everything became colder and colder. Looking at the sun, its light diminished severely, its heat only a fraction of what it normally was. This darkness covered the empire for years, noxious fumes flowed through the air and the I worst side of heretics, like Theodora, emerged, with her incriminating John the Cappadocian of treason. Theodora began being a bitch about a great many things really, but Justinian cared not. That bitchiness is why he married her. No, he just exiled John to end the matter and concentrate on the apocalyptic omen at hand. The diminished solar activity crippled farming efforts. Yes, okay, I know exactly what he's talking about. So, there are several videos on YouTube that talk about the worst year in history. I believe it's 625, allow me to double check. No, it was 536, I was... I don't know why I said 625, I must have been thinking about something else, but point is, yeah, that's, a lot of videos on YouTube I remember, like, years ago looking at, basically, like, of volcanic activity happened, the sun was almost gone for the whole time, it was overall really awful time in human history, some say the worst year ever, well, a lot of people have that opinion, but... Yeah, I think that's that's exactly what they're talking about. Happy I remembered that. I it was a long time ago since I saw the, those videos. And famine ensued. But by then, Justinian was still too busy sending reinforcements to Belisarius in Italy and civilizing savages. And it had been right there, Khosrow publicly broke the peace and invaded the empire. But Dara stood strong in his path. Unable to take Dara, Khosrow faked some diplomatic talk with a local city's bishop. And as he returned home, he burst through the gates and took it. With Belisarius still trying to get a high score in Italy and Sita's crushing an Armenian insurrection, getting killed for it by an insurrectionist named Artabanes, Justinian sent Germanus to protect Antioch. But its walls were still a wreck, having no choice but to retreat. Khosrow thus led his hordes to take and utterly ruin Antioch, slaughtering tens of thousands, further destroying the city as much as he could, bathing the blood of murdered innocents in the Mediterranean, and once he finally left, he reigned terror in other cities, forcing chariot games to be rigged so that the Greens, his favorites, would win. With no army nearby, oh Justinian agreed with now that's the, the most savage evil peace, thing I've ever he heard. To, and then immediately broke it by extorting cities on his way out and attacking Dara, trying to destroy its walls, only then leaving. With him, he dragged 30,000 Antiochian citizens, making them slaves and forcing them to live in a hellish version of their ruined city, given an ironic name for its ironic torture. Justinian had had enough. If the barbarian Sassanids so wanted war, he promised they would get a war that they would never forget. Told to rush east, Belisarius had no time for another triumph, and prepared to crush Khosrow for good. And although his officers would act up again, Belisarius focused on pushing the barbarians away. And when treating with them, he took most of his army carrying just hunting equipment to make it seem like a small hunting party from a gigantic army further west. And like the Goths, the Sassanids fell for it. 
After this turn of tables, Artabanes and his forces would defect to the Roman side, and were allowed to. In these dark years, Projecta had been married to the now governor of Africa. Then he was killed by a Vandal survivor, who sought to rebuild the Vandal kingdom and take the emperor's niece for himself. Then Artabanes murdered him to prove loyalty to said emperor, and also to have said emperor's niece for himself. But when he took her to Constantinople to marry, Theodora had already returned to her senses, and noting that he was, you know, already married, she forbid him from marrying her niece, infuriating him. As for Justinian, he was far too stressed out to care. While in the frontier, Belisarius was getting the legions available and ready, battle formations taken and plans devised, only for nothing to happen. The border was dead silent, the Sassanids never attacked, the only thing to come from the east being tales of horror and death. Meanwhile, in Egypt, a sailor was working on a ship delivering wheat to all across the empire. But one day, he started feeling strange pains in his head, in his arms and legs. He couldn't sleep well, he was filled with the most terrible nightmares, his eyes went bloodshot. Little by little, other sailors started reporting similar pains, ever more painful as the sun darkened ever more. A little later, a ship was noticed crashing into port, and the dock workers went to check inside. To their horror, they found the entire ship's crew rotting in pools of blood. Trying to at least understand what happened, they found strange dark spots all over the corpses. Bubones, the mark of the Black Death. The bubonic oh, no. plague soon took over all of Egypt, and was unknowingly carried off in several more green ships to all corners of the empire. City by city, people began to fall ill, vomit blood, rot from the inside, and die. No one understood the cause, much less a cure. This was the work of pure evil. In Constantinople, of the 500,000 citizens therein... Oh, yeah, we all know about the Black Plague. Like, yeah, I learned about that a lot in school, and just how that completely ruined, you know, the world, and yeah, I keep forgetting, we're like in medieval times now, like, with all of this, like, I keep forgetting that, but it's like, yeah, the Byzantines lasted quite a while, like, they, they did last into, like, the medieval age, and I keep forgetting that, so when I'm seeing this, I'm like, whoa, we've come far, you know? Over 200,000 would be killed. All surviving citizens stayed on lockdown, leaving only to bury their friends and family. Mass graves were ordered dig, and no matter how much Justinian tried to provide relief, the devastation to the economy, armies and peoples of the empire was far too great to mitigate. The plague spared none, especially not unreplaceable great minds like Tribonians, another of its victims. Indeed, even Justinian himself was eventually infected. The Bubonis consuming his body, the severe fever rising up and feeling of impending death seizing him. At the height of their terror, the infected began seeing demonic apparitions in the future, the horsemen of the apocalypse, headless demons, and hellish ghosts posing as angels dissuading them from the one true faith in exchange for their lives. The deaths in the millions, the economic destruction and deep trauma far surpassed that of any short-term crisis or barbarian threat ever endured. In all, a full third of the empire's population was killed, and the truth is, you would never. Hello, I'm Patrick Stewart. Did you know that right now? Recover. Better said, he could not be allowed to recover. And when the ultimate vulture came for the empire its weakest, he resurrected the Ostrogoths from the depths of hell, unleashing oh them gosh. once again over Italy. The very second Italy was in peril, Justinian woke up, healed from the plague and calling on Belisarius again, sending him to Italy again, suffering the presence of John again, who disobeyed orders and went for easy victories again. Rallying behind some undead goth named Totila, the goths laid siege to the Eternal City, whose garrison, what the plague spared anyway, were barbarian mercenaries. Speaking barbarian to barbarian, Totila convinced Anisarion to turn traitor and open the gates for him. Once inside, Totila sent a letter to the emperor warning that if the Romans didn't leave Italy, then he would destroy Rome for good. He received a quick reply, daring him to even try. 
terrified, Totila just marched south to attack the Edict General that was all by himself, opening way for Belisarius to re retake Rome from him. But back in the east, so many years of heresy, sunless days, and cancerous behavior had taken a toll on Theodora. So much so, she contracted cancer and died. Justinian deeply mourned her death. She was often a pain of a heretic wife, but she was his pain of a heretic wife. Uncoincidentally, Belisarius was recalled back to Constantinople shortly afterwards, and having again saved Rome, the aging general chose to enter a well-deserved retirement. Saying goodbye to such a competent general hurt, but some consolation laid with his cousin, Germanus, plus his two sons, Justin and Justinian the Younger, who he had before marrying Matasunfa, who was only now pregnant. Their loyalty was proved when Artabanes, still bitter, plotted to murder Justinian and the retired Belisarius, usurping the empire in the name of Germanus, who he never informed about such plot. Justin ended up finding out, telling his father, who then told the excubitors, who then arrested Artabanes, forcing him to go fight against the undead Goths. Having no sons of his own, Justinian sent his cousin and apparent heir, Germanus, to finish the reconquest of Italy. Then he died of a random illness, not even bubonic plague, leaving a pregnant widow behind and a decrepit Liberius to replace him in Italy. Liberius did defend Sicily, but that wasn't enough, so Justinian sent Narses to take over, and given how the plague gutted the legions, he gave him the funds necessary to hire a whole bunch of barbarian mercenaries. Among the tons of barbarians he hired was a new Germanic horde settling nearby Italy, the Lombards. John did what he did best, winning an easy victory, and Narses regrouped with Belisarius' veterans to amass some 30,000 men in total. And with all of those legions and mercenaries, he crushed the undead Gothic legions, killing Totila again. The main battle won, Narses paid and told the Lombards to leave. The longer they stayed in Italy, the more troublesome they got. The Goths had taken Rome again, but Narses re re retook it, and when the last remnants of their hordes gathered near what was once Pompeii, Narses outnumbered them to death. And with that, ending what Belisarius had already ended. Just in time for the second Frankish intervention. In their infinite barbarian wisdom, the Franks decided to split their horde. One marched east and was crushed by Narcissus' legions, and the other marched west, where they caught the bubonic plague and deteriorated away. The Ostrogoths were once again dead, but the Visigoths were still kicking around. Kicking meaning raping, and around meaning Hispania. Barbarians being barbarians, they were once again slaughtering each other to be king of the mud huts, with one of the would be mud hut majesty asking the nearby Romans for help. Being told of this chance, even after decades of rule, war, and plague, the death of his loved ones and the deterioration of his mind and body, Justinian still believed in the dream that once was Rome, and so ordered Liberius to reconquer as much of Hispania as possible. So as the Visigoths kept killing each other, Liberius led a nostalgic reconquest of the birthplaces of Trajan and Hadrian to beyond what was once New Carthage. The victorious Mudhut Majesty tried fighting back, but failed, for now. And this was it. The Eastern Roman Empire stood at its greatest extent. Africa, Italy, and even some of Hispania were conquered. But due to the plague, wars and disasters, the empire's population was now lower than it had been decades before the reconquests. It's really all downhill from here. Throughout the- Yeah, so I was correct in Justinian being the one who reconquered, you know, so much of the, the West. And it's sad because this, this really is the peak. And the Byzantines really got the short end of the stick, you know, the, the Romans, they, you know, dealt with the plagues, and then other Christian European, you know, nations just turning on them, like, they, they got screwed, like, they got the short end of the stick, and this really was the last. I see now why Justinian is the one, the only Byzantine emperor I've heard of, because, like, yeah, he probably... If we're just looking in the line of the Byzantines separating all the other ones, he probably so far is the best, you know? And Yeah, so sad. It's like it's almost like the last death grip of the of the once you know, glorious Roman Empire. Like we got getting so much land and then Yeah, we know it's not gonna last because watching 
Byzantine slowly shrink to just be Constantinople and a few islands is... Yeah, it's gonna be the saddest thing ever. Countless attempts that would yet be made to restore what Rome once was, none would ever come as close as Justinian's. As for Justinian's later years, they would be the same as for all of those who rule Rome for decades. Disappointing. For all of his great reforms, he could never make the Senate worthwhile. At least now he was led by a capable patrician, Paul, keeping one of the last patrician clans of old Roman origins still alive. The Black Death came and left again and again, but every time it killed only the non-immune, little children and babies. Never remarrying and thus remaining childless, Justinian's two likeliest heirs, the two Justins, vowed that whoever of them became the emperor, the other would be made his right-hand man. Now, here's a tough question. Taking over their father's legacy, Justin and Justinian the Younger joined the legions and helped fend off any Sassanid attacks. His hordes destroyed by his own lord's plague and now facing capable Romans again, Khosrau begrudgingly agreed to a peace. For now. Just as soon as there was peace in the empire as the Bulgars were invading the Balkans again. With no active generals nearby, Justinian turned to Belisarius for help, who dutifully left retirement and gathered some 300 retired veterans, plus some civilians fleeing south to fight the barbarians. Camping nearby a passage Belisarius knew the Bulgars would cross, he, and say it with me, lit several fires to make it <laughs> seem like he had a gigantic army camping nearby, scaring the Bulgars into only sending a few thousand barbarians to cross, who he stopped with 100 veterans, while the other 200 veterans flanked them from the wood. That reminds me, didn't General Lee from the American Civil War, like, I think there were several points where his army wasn't that big. And so he, like, marched, like, in circles to trick northern generals that his army was much bigger than it was. <laughs> uh, I, I love recognizing that. Man, I might, I might become a history buff, or I might become, like, a history buff if I keep reacting to more history videos woods, making them flee to the north. And yeah, the barbarians just kept falling for this, hardly surprising though. Justin <laughs> would take over from there, and face yet another barbarian nomad horde migrating west, the Afars. Fleeing from the east, they demanded lands in the empire. Shockingly, Justinian refused, but before the Avars invaded, Justin had repaired the damage the Bulgars had dealt to the local defenses, so they just, you know, chilled beyond the Danube, for now. But then one day, Belisarius was forcefully dragged into a court and accused of most heinous treason against the emperor, the case being overseen by a certain Procopius, who immediately judged him guilty and condemned him to imprisonment. Feel no why. Thrown into a dark cell to rot away, he was quickly freed from it by none other than Justinian himself, who instantly pardoned him of all made-up charges. That's awesome. But his freedom wouldn't last long as Belisarius would soon after die in his home estate, and with him, the last of Justinian's will to keep on living. Despite growing ever less attached to this mortal world, Justinian would make one final attempt to end the Monophysite heresy, and what he didn't achieve in his prime, he didn't achieve in his old age. In retrospect, Justinian's life had been one of constantly fighting against the odds. When his enlightened reforms drew the wrath of the old system, he rang them into submission. When all believed the West had fallen for good, he had Belisarius prove them wrong. As heretics continually tried to further divide the church, he acted as the foremost defender of the faith's unity. When the plague came to usher in the apocalypse, he survived it and kept the empire intact. Barbarian after barbarian would attack from every direction, but the generals he appointed sought to beat them all back. All this conflict, all this death and suffering, but Justinian never regretted it, for he knew that there once was a dream, a dream worth fighting for. After so many decades, at a night of his 83rd year, Justinian became weaker and weaker, with only a local palace bureaucrat to notice. What the great emperor's last thoughts were, no one knows. Was it pride in his loss that would stand for millennia? Was it disdain for the plague that killed so many and hindered his reconquests? Was it about his heirs, or his enemies and the heretics? Or perhaps it was joy over those he would get to soon see. 
In the end, none would know. After four decades of great rule, Justinian was dead. The tragedy of the fall of Rome looms large in the common psyche, prompting many to have asked through the centuries. What if there just had been the right reforms? What if they had given their all to reconquer the lost provinces? What if they had fought against the tides of history? Justinian, Belisarius, and so many heroes of this age wore that what if. Decades they spent fighting to restore what once was and achieved far more than most ever dared dream of. While all men, no matter how great, eventually die, for as long as there are those who remember the dream that was Rome, the reign of he who dreamt it the most shall never be forgotten. The reign of Justinian the Great. So yeah, Justinian really does seem like, I think he probably was the last hope of like, or possibility of Rome being back, and he got pretty far, and it's gonna be a shame to see just how it falls apart, well, in these next two videos that is, he obviously couldn't get through all of it, but, yeah, I love, man, I really love Justinian, like now I'd learn more about him, yeah, he's awesome, he's, he's up there, man. <laughs> Him and Belisarius, they're the duo. I don't want to. I don't want to leave Belisarius out of this because it's like Augustus and Agrippa. Like a lot of people will overlook Agrippa, but like without him, I don't know how Augustus could have done a lot. And I think the same goes with Belisarius for Justinian. And that was awesome. Yeah, the Byzantines—they got screwed by history and the world, you know. But. Overall, I really love I really love this video. This was fun. I'm gonna go react to the next one, and you know, get through this as quick as possible. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone.